In this chapter, we'll talk about screen layout and items. Screen layout is about where on the screen Zepri should put uh, boxes. This is a surprisingly tricky topic, even for veteran Zepri programmers, but I'll try to make it clear for you. With regard to the items, we'll start with output items. The output items we already encountered in the public goods game experiment but there are many more options with regard to what you can do with these um, output items and in particular also how you can format the output that you want. We then move on to input items and discuss what input options we have and furthermore also how we can check for the correctness of these inputs to make sure our subjects can only enter values that we expect and would like to see entered. There is a number of settings that you can or have to make when you create a box in Zetri. And I'm going to illustrate these using the example of the standard box, but they are the same for most boxes in Zetri. First off, you can set a name for your box. And that is mainly to help you identify what the box does or displays in the stage tree, so in your Zetri window. You can also tell Zetri whether you want the box to have a frame, so basically a thin black line running around the outside of the box um, to give it some, well, some border. Now it becomes more interesting. We can set the width and the height of the box uh, in these fields here. And we can specify these in pixels by using P and in percent by using percent. So if in this field here you write 50P, that would mean that the box should be 50 pixels wide uh, under all circumstances. So irrespective of how big the screen is, for example. If you write 50%, of course, uh, the box will be scaled to half of the width of the current screen or screen area that the box is, box is put in. I'll come back to what I mean by screen area uh, in a few minutes. Now, by default, Setri, if you don't put anything in here, just makes the box fill the entire screen. Furthermore, Setri, by default, puts the box into the, in the middle of the screen. Now, if you have a box that is full screen, it doesn't matter really where Setri puts it, but if you specify these values here or one of these values, then it will uh, matter where Setri puts the box. And you can control this with this second um, area here. Um, you can tell Setri what distance to the margin of the screen, so to the border of the screen or the screen area, you want to put your box in. So for example, if in the top field here, you enter 100p, that would mean um, the box should start uh, 100 pixels below the top of the screen. Furthermore, you can specify this in percent and say it should start say 10% below the top of the screen. Um, these, these two fields, of course, may conflict. And in that case, it's not entirely clear what Zetri does here. So you should make sure that you program these ideally without conflict. What do I mean by conflict? Well, if you specify a width of 50%, but you specify a distance to the margin of 60%, then that doesn't really work, right? Because the box has 50% of the width of the screen that is available but it should be positioned 60% away from the margin. Yeah? So you only have 40% room left, but you want to position a box of 50% size in there, that doesn't work because the size is always relative to the entire screen or screen area. Now, what do I mean by screen area? Well, let me come to this here. You can tell Setri after it has positioned the current box, to adjust the remaining screen area for boxes that follow after the current box. And I'll show you this in an example uh, right after this slide. So bear with me while, uh, while I get there. Furthermore, most boxes have a so-called display condition. The display condition is a field where you can enter a condition like variable A equals five or um, endowment uh, smaller than 20 something like this and then the box only is displayed if this condition is fulfilled otherwise the box is simply not shown on the screen it's, it's like it's invisible and finally you can tell Setri where to position the buttons by default they will be put on the lower left of the screen or lower right sorry of the screen and will be arranged in rows which means the first button will be at the 
bottom right. The next one will be next to it to the left and so on in rows until the entire bottom of the screen is filled and then uh, the next um, row will be started. Usually you don't need to change the, the button arrangement, but you can do this down here. And on the next slide, I want to see you an example of the so-called demo of the screen layout uh, that you can also find in the course materials. So let me show you this uh, demo for the Setry screen layout, which actually contains quite a number of um, things that you can do in Setry. So I click Run, Start Treatment, or I press F5, and then I switch to my Set Leaf, which you can see now already shows uh, a number of things. First off, it shows um, at the top, it shows the header. And the header contains this information. This is period one of one. And it usually also contains the information, um, how much time is remaining in this period. Now, the fact that there is nothing here, despite the program uh, running, tells you one of two things. Either I stopped the time before I started um, this, this treatment, because I can stop the clock before I start the treatment, and the clock basically never stops, uh, starts running. Or I set this stage uh, to have an infinite um, amount of time, so no timeout. Let's see what it is. And for that, I switch back to set tree. And um, I open this, this definition for the, for the first stage. And as you can see here, I set the timeout to minus one. And once you put a negative number into timeout, that means uh, for set tree, that it should not start a timeout, so that the, the, the stage should last forever. So that's why there is no time running. Furthermore, as you saw in the active screen, I said background screen is being used. And in the background in the active screen, there is this header that we saw on top of the screen. So that is where this comes from. Maybe let me click in there again. And this header has a height of 10% of the total height of the screen. And it is located at the top of the screen. So it has zero uh, pixels margin or distance to the top margin, to the top um, border of the screen. Now, since I, since I said background screen is being used, this is drawn first, the header. And then, now sorry for going out, uh, for leaving that box. Um, and then I have this adjustment to the remaining box set here. And as you can see, the adjustment is top. What does this mean? This means that Setry paints the header box with this height at, in this position, and then basically cuts off the top of the screen. So everything above the lower border of the header box is cut off um, from the screen which means that if I now draw a new box after this first header box, um, and I, say, I tell Satri um, to, to fill the entire screen with this new box, the new box will only fill the screen area below this header box. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. Here is a standard box where I have no width or height set and the distance to the margin is also not set. And that tells Setri that it should simply cover the entire screen. But because I cut off um, the top of the screen, we only see um, we, we only see this box down here below the header box. Okay, so that is the the first part. But this is essentially more or less the simplest version of a Setri screen that we can um, use a standard box which can contains one item and one button. Let me switch back just for a second to show you. We have this one output item here and we have this button here. The output item defined like this and the button also just goes to the next stage. If you click this button, you go to the next stage. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm cheating here because normally when the program is running, you cannot actually open these, um, these elements here. Yeah, you need to wait or finalize the program, finish the program, that's tra uh, the treatment is currently running before you can change something here again. But I'm actually showing you a, se showing you a second set tree that is not running. So the actual experiment is running in a different set tree, just so you know how I was doing that, because you, in case you were wondering. 
Now let's see what happens next in our experiment, in our demo. Now we see this is a simple box with one item with no formatting and no header. So how did I do this? Well, I think um, it's not too hard to figure out now. I have a second stage and in the second stage in the active screen, I did not say to use the background screen. So that's how I get Setri not to paint the header. And then I have this uh, example for the simple box, which just contains um, a standard box that fills the entire screen with one item and one button. And by the way, this is uh, what is called a container box. Uh, don't worry about it for the time being. I'll come back to this uh, after these examples. So quite soon, but for the time being, um, ignore that this is there, okay? Imagine we simply had this box there. Okay, now next step. We click next here. Now what do we see here? What I did here was I drew uh, on an empty screen, I drew a box that should fill the entire screen. And that's the one that is that you can see here. And you can see it's cut off basically because it's in the background. It was drawn first. So it's put on the screen, it fills the entire screen. And then I drew a second box. And the second box um, is drawn over the first box. And it's drawn with a width of 50% and located zero pixel from the left uh, margin of the screen. And that's how you get the one box drawn over the other box. So um, we can look at this here. So I first draw the simple box, which covers the entire screen. Now there's no setting here. And then I draw the second box, which has a width of 50%, zero uh, pixels from the left margin, uh, and that's it. This one is drawn over the other one. The next uh, example is I have two boxes side by side. Now, how could I do that? Well, I could um, put the boxes there by saying this is 50% and zero point pixels from the left uh, margin, and this is 50% and zero pixels from the right margin. But I did it differently here. I first drew this box here saying with 50%, zero pixels from the left margin and said alignment of the remaining box, adjustment of the remaining box by cutting left, which means I basically cut off this part of the screen such that only this part over here was left. And then I drew a box without any settings. So a box that should cover the entire screen or screen area. Um, and this covered this area because of that. So let's see where this is. First is the box 50% zero pixels from the left with the left of the screen now being cut off. And then comes a simple box with no settings, but since uh, there is only half of the screen remaining, it only fills this half of the screen. Okay. Now I can also, of course, align the first box, not zero pixels from the left border, but for example, 100 pixels from the left border. And then if I cut off the left of the screen, well, this entire area, including the margin, gets cut off because everything that is to the left of the right hand border of this box gets cut off. And the next box that covers the entire screen area that is left only covers this area here. I can also use display conditions to switch boxes on or off. And this is quite neat. As you can see here, if I click this button, a box appears here. Well, the box actually was always defined here, but it was not shown because I have a variable called display switch, which was set to zero, but which by clicking this button, I changed to a value of one. And this box here has a display condition saying display switch equals equals one. By the way, forget about or ignore the backslash at the beginning here for the time being. I'll come back to that uh, in a later session again. So the switch button changes the value of display switch from zero to one and back again. Let's look at this in the code. I have first this box 50% from the left, 50% um, width uh, at the left uh, border cutting off the left area of the screen and then have the switch button which well it's a bit more complicated but um, it switches if the display switch is zero it switches it to one and otherwise it switches it to zero and this box here 
has the condition display switch equals equals one. So only in the case where the display switch uh, is one is this box being shown. And I can switch it on and off by this button. Now finally, um, this can be used, the switching function can be used to very powerful effects to generate a kind of dynamic screen layout. So for example, I can turn on a text display here, basically a box that just has a little text saying this box has a display condition saying display switch equals equals one. Instead, if I click data entry, I get this box, which, which uh, contains a text that says this box is only displayed if display switch equals equals two, and it contains an input item. Or I can uh, show this contract creation box, which is a type of box that we haven't covered yet, but that we'll come to. Um, but as you can see, it looks quite different again. And uh, this is displayed because display switch is now equal equal three. And if I click any of the other buttons again, I can switch back and forth between these different uh, boxes. Now that you've seen the screen layout demo, let's have a little quiz. And here I need you to pause the video uh, whenever I say so, so you can actually think about it and come up with your own answer before I provide you with the solution. So imagine that this green box here, uh, that is the entire computer screen. And we haven't drawn anything on it yet, so it's uh, empty. And now the first box comes around and the box has this kind of uh, settings. So um, it has got a height of 10% and it's got distance to the margin of zero pixels and it adjusts the remaining box uh, towards the top. So now think about where this box could be positioned, what it could look like. So imagine it or maybe draw it on a piece of paper and once you come up, came up with the solution, then you, um, because now you, I need you to pause the video and then you unpause the video and have a look at whether you've been right. Okay, so did you get it right? So it has 10% height, 10% of the total screen. Yeah? And it's positioned with a distance of zero pixels to the top. So that's why it's up there. Since no width is given, it fills the entire width. Um, and the adjustment of the remaining box is irrelevant for this box, but only affects the next box or all the other boxes that follow. So that brings us to the second um, box. So we're now adding a box that has a width of 50 pixels and a distance to the margin of 20 pixels towards the top, the left, and the bottom. Again, the remaining box after the first um, box was adjusted towards the top. So think about what uh, this new box could look like, where it could be, and then unpause the video after you've now paused it. Okay, there it goes. Since we since only the lower part of the screen was left uh, due to the adjustment towards the top, which basically cut off this upper part here, uh, the box needs to go in this lower part. It has a distance of 20 pixels from the top, from the left and from the bottom, and its width is 50 pixels. Now, of course, this entire uh, graph here is not to scale, but it, I think um, it's, it's close enough to give you a good idea. Okay, the third box um, has a width of 30%, a height of 50%, no distance to the margins is given, and um, the box after this box has been drawn, the remaining box will be adjusted towards the bottom. So pause the video and come up with your solution. So there it goes. 30% um, of the width of the screen is pretty similar to 50% of the height of the screen. And by screen, I actually now mean the screen area because of course, uh, the top was cut off after the first uh, box. So this looks nearly square, uh, even though these widths suggest something otherwise, right? So remember how, well, how relative positioning or relative sizing works here. And it's positioned in the middle since no distance to the margins is given, then Setri uh, positions the box in the middle. Now we cut off the bottom and now 
I ask you to imagine where the fourth box will be drawn. The fourth box has no width and height given and no distance to the margins. So where does it go? Pause your video and come up with the solution, please. Okay, there it is. Now, what is uh, interesting about this box, or maybe surprising, is first off, uh, we cut off the bottom of the screen, well, everything below the top of box three, with this adjustment for box three here. Furthermore, we did not cut anything here, so the box is actually drawn over box two. Yeah? Since it's drawn later than box two, it's drawn over to box two. And since it has neither width nor height given and no distance to the margins, it basically fills all the area that is left below box one, because we cut off the top here, and above box three, because we cut off the bottom here. Did you get it right? Now, to make sure you have internalized your new knowledge about um, screen layout, I would actually like you to program a treatment which displays the following screen here. And for that, you start out with an empty set tree um, treatment. So you start a new set tree instance, and in the, in the new untitled treatment, uh, you add a new stage, that's important. And then in the active screen of this stage, you can start positioning these boxes. So you need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight boxes. And in each of these boxes, I would like you to put an item that um, prints the text box one, box two, box three. It doesn't need to be bold and, and large as here, but just normal text, so you know which box is which. And um, you can you can position these boxes, or you can order these boxes in the stage tree any way you want. So the box seven can go before box one if you think it makes sense. But remember that boxes that are farther down the stage tree, or later in the stage tree, are Print, uh, point, painted on top of um, earlier boxes that are um, in the same place. Uh, so in this case, you can see that box seven must be painted after box one and box two, otherwise it wouldn't paint over the two. Uh, and uh, a little bit of advice, start with box six, because you need the OK button, otherwise you can never stop your treatment. Um, and that's a bit annoying for testing. So make sure you program the box uh, six maybe first and immediately add an OK button that lets you leave the stage because then when you open the treatment for testing, and I recommend actually testing while you're programming. So you program the first box, you test it. You program the second one, you test it. Because uh, it's quite likely that the, the positioning of the boxes that you um, attempt here will not work out on first try. And when you have all the boxes there, it's very hard to find the mistakes. Um, so start with one box and then add another, add another, and always check whether the result looks as you uh, expected it to look. After discussing screen layout as it pertains to the sizing and positioning of boxes, the next thing I want to discuss are items. Items are text output or other forms of output or input on the screen, and you've already seen some of them. And I want to start with some general information about items. First off, items are vertically centered on screen, which means the first item that you create is put in the middle of the screen. If you add another, then both of them are shifted such that they're centered on the screen. If you have three, then the, the middle one is exactly in the center of the screen and so on. Multiple items are printed top to bottom. So the topmost item in your stage tree will also be the topmost item on a subject screens. If you don't provide a variable in the item, remember in the item creation uh, dialog, you can specify a variable that is then displayed, like in the case of the uh, endowment in the public goods game, we had the uh, variable uh, the, the variable output said your endowment, and then the variable this we specified was endowment, which meant that Cedric took what was in the variable and displayed it on the screen after the text, your endowment, and a colon, which Cedric added automatically. Now, if you don't provide a variable, then the entire text is centered horizontally as well as vertically. 
If you put a variable in or use an underscore instead of the variable, then Setry prints a, a, a label column, which in the case of the item that I just referred to would say your endowment, and the variable column, which in this case would be 20. So you have two columns left and right, which are invisible in a sense, but if you have multiple items, uh, you will see that they're all um, formatted into these columns. Now, multi-line items, so if you have an item that contains so much text that it um, goes uh, over multiple lines on screen, because they simply are longer than the screen is wide, uh, then they're automatically aligned left instead of centered. Yeah, that's something to watch out for, because this may be unexpected behavior, but that's the default in Setry. And finally, you can just put in an empty item in, uh, in a box, and that will generate a blank line. So if you have multiple items and you want to separate some um, lines of text from others, you can just put in an empty item in between them, and that will generate an empty line. So this is an example from the manual. And you can see uh, multiple of the things that I already told, just told you. So we have a standard box. And in this box, we have the first item, which just contains text. The text that says text without variables are displayed centered. Text without variables are displayed centered. I'm, it's not my uh, grammar here. Uh, but as you can see, this, this line of text is really in the center of the box in terms of horizontal uh, alignment. Then we have an empty item, and that generates an empty line here, so empty space here. Then we have an item that says shows variable A, and the variable that is uh, specified in this item is called A, which means that Setry in the stage tree will uh, display this with this out A, which means this is an output item that displays variable A. So in this case, the variable A contains the value 17. That's why you see the 17 here. And you also see that this, um, this item is in these two columns, the first column here, the second column here. And the, the, the first column, the left column, is always right-oriented, yeah, right-justified. Variable B is basically the same as variable A. And then if instead of the variable you just put an underscore, it will display the text in the column, but without displaying a variable here. Yeah, it's, it's also aligned in, these, in this column uh, formatting, but without uh, displaying a variable here. Then we have another empty item. Then we have an input item. And you see that the input that the subject makes here is saved in a variable called C. And the text is please enter value uh, for C. And you see that also this text and this um, input field are aligned in these two invisible columns here. And then we have a, another empty um, item and an OK button. If we didn't have this empty item, the whole uh, block of um, items would be shifted downwards a little bit, half a, half a line, basically. Now let's go through the different types of items you can define in Setry. And some of them you already know. This is probably the most simple item you can create, uh, except for an empty item. So the empty item would just be entirely empty here. Uh, a standard text output item simply contains text in the label field of the item. And what this would look like on screen is something like this. Okay, so just standard text in the default uh, font size of Setry without any formatting. That's it. And it would be horizontally uh, centered as we saw on the previous slide. Now we've also encountered this, um, uh, a label including a variable and a layout. And now let me talk a little about, a bit about this layout because this will become very important. The layout that we see here, one means that whatever number is in this uh, variable, if it is a numeric variable, um, it will be formatted as a multiple of one or it will be rounded to the nearest multiple of one which means, well, if this variable is an integer variable anyway, then it doesn't matter. But if it's a real variable, then it will be rounded. So if subject, the subject number in this variable would be 7.4, the, uh, the item would actually display a 7. 
And if it's 7.6, it would actually display an 8 because it's rounded to the nearest whole number, to the nearest multiple of 1 in this case. So what this would look like is exactly this here. We see on the left, we have the label. On the right, in the right column, a right-hand column, there is the variable. Now, this is a standard input item, which we've also encountered already with a label text, a variable that it uh, saves the input in. A layout, and now the layout means something a little bit different. A layout here in an input item, where this is ticked, means that subjects can only enter numbers that are multiples of one. So here you could not enter a variable or a number like 0 0.7. You can only enter 1, 2, 3, minus 5, 100, etc. But actually, in this specific example, you cannot enter minus 5 because the minimum is set to 0. So you can only enter um, whole numbers between 0 and 10,000 in this case. Furthermore, uh, this box down here allows you to um, tell Cetri to show the value of this variable p when the screen is first displayed. So if you tick this box, Cetri would, um, when you see this screen, already have filled this um, box for you with the, the value of the variable or a default value that you can specify down here. Yeah, so if you want to pre-fill certain uh, fields in your, on your screen, that's how you can do it. And finally, normally, every uh, field on a screen in Cetri has to be filled for people to be able to click the OK button and continue to the next stage. But you can click this empty allowed checkbox here, and that would allow uh, your subjects to continue to the next screen by clicking a button, even if they've not um, entered uh, something into this field. Now, this is what this field would look like. A standard input item is the label. And then to the right, there is the, um, the box where they can enter to make their entry. Now we get uh, a bit more sophisticated. What we're doing here is we're again displaying a label and a variable, but we're not displaying this variable as a kind of normal number. We're instead reformatting this variable or the value in this variable, the period number, to text. And the way we do this is that whatever is in the period variable um, is compared to these three options in this case here. Yeah, the, these three numbers. And um, set tree, instead of displaying the number of the period, chooses that text which corresponds to the number that is closest to the value in period. What does this mean? Well, if the period number, so if period, the variable, equals 1 or 2, then that Cetri would print the period was less than the third because that's what's in the text here. If the period was period 3, then it would display the third because this is here. If the period is four, five, six, or whatever, it would display more than the third. Now, of course, if the period could be minus seven, um, it would also display less than a third because it's closest to two out of these three options. If the period number is 2.7, it would display the third because it's closest to three. The period numbers uh, usually, of course, are full, uh, whole numbers, integers. Now, one important thing to keep in mind here is that when this item is first displayed on the screen, so when subjects first see the screen, Cetri um, sets the size of the item, which means the first text version, if this is the third, for example, that's very short, and this is how much space Cetri reserves on screen for this text here, and then if while people look at this screen, the value in period changes um, and becomes 4, for example, the, the um, text that is being displayed would change to more than the third, but since this is much longer than the third, it would be cut off somewhere here. Okay? So you would in only see part of the text. So that's something to watch out for, and the way to circumvent this problem is 
to add blank spaces be, be, uh, after very short items such that there is enough space even to accommodate the longer items. Now we can also use uh, this text formatting here to completely forego the label so we don't have any label at all here. As a variable we just put a number we don't actually need to put a variable here we can also specify a number directly but in this case we don't actually use this number what we're doing is all of what we want to display is specified down here in this layout in this case so what's going on here the first thing is um, we, we display this um, as text again and we only have one option only one number and one um, text and a quote so it will always no matter what i put here it will always display this text so it will always say this item displays the content of the variable period blah 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 and then you see this uh these less than and greater than signs now they enclose variables so this is a variable and then we have this vertical bar here and the layout for this variable so what we're doing here is we're telling set tree to in this position here insert the value that is in the variable period formatted as a multiple of one and here to look into the subject variable and uh, take the number and format it again as a multiple of one and put it here and then it said that what this looks like is this item displays the content of the variable period and here we have the value of the period variable and subject and here is the value of the subject variable and finally we have this less than and greater than sign at the beginning of the layout that is to tell Satri that there will be or can be um, variables in this uh, string here in this text so if we forget that, then Setri would actually print all of this code here. So it will print on the screen down here, not a one where, where, where it says period, but instead uh, point, uh, the, the less than sign period, the vertical bar, a one and the greater than sign. So to prevent that, to tell Setri to correctly interpret the variables that are inserted into this text, we need to, uh, at the beginning, put this less than and greater than sign. We can also use this text um, layout to use rich text formatting. Rich text formatting is a format that well is, is used in, in many programs, including you can also in Microsoft Word, for example, save text in rich text format. And what this means is that you have some formatting commands that you can enter in the form of a backslash and then a specific command. So let me switch over here where it's slightly bigger. So in this case, we're displaying the text. This item displays formatted text, but we tell Satri at the beginning we need to well we need to enclose it into these curly brackets, and then we tell Satri we will use rich text formatting here. So backslash RTF just tell Satri watch out rich text uh, codes to follow. And then we tell Satri how to format it. We tell it backslash FS22, that stands for font size 22, so make it bigger, the font. Backslash B stands for bold text. Backslash I stands for italics. And the result looks like this. It's the text is bigger than normal. It's in bold and it's in italics. So we've really formatted this text using these rich text um, formatting commands here. The next thing we want to do is to bring some color into our text. And for that, we again use this um, layout formatting method. So that, again, we only have one option here. So it doesn't really matter what I put into the variable here. I can put a one or a zero or any other variable. It will always display uh, this text here. And what does this text uh, layout do? First off, we tell Setri here that there will be or can be variables in the text and they should be displayed as well, the value of the variables and not as, as uh, the code that is in here. Then we tell Setri we want to use rich text formatting and we need to define the colors that we're going to use in our text. So we tell uh, Setri by using these curly brackets again here backslash color tbl stands for color table 
we're defining a table of colors. We're telling Cetri the first color we want to use is 255 parts red, zero parts green, zero parts blue, which means pure red. The second color is red zero, green zero, blue 255, which means pure blue. And the third color is zero red, zero green, zero blue, which is black. Okay, then we close our color table. So this is just the definition to tell Cetri, look, remember these colors, we're gonna use them later on. Then we tell Cetri to format everything in font size 24. And then we start our text. This is A. And then we tell Cetri to switch to color number two which is blue. Colorfully formatted, Cetri, switch to color number three, which is black. Output box displaying the variable votes in color one, which is red. Here we display the votes uh, as a multiple of one. Then we switch back to black and num subjects in red, num subjects, multiple of one, switch back to black and a full stop. Now, these backslashes here uh, before, so preceding the variable names, there's something special that I'll come back to later on and that you don't need to worry about. Everything else is really the formatting. So telling Cetri which colors to use. And the result is done here. We see that the text is uh, bigger than normal. It's uh, font size 24. It has blue color for this part and it has red color for the two numbers. So if I haven't confused you enough with my formatting yet, I'll give it another go now. So um, we're again using the text formatting. We're again using uh, variables in this uh, layout. We're telling Cetri that we're using rich text formatting. So let me switch over here. Rich text formatting, font size 24. And then we're doing something special. We're saying take the period variable and again here, format it as text, not as a number. So here, remember I said after the vertical bar here, we would simply specify the formatting. So we can again here specify text as formatting. And we're telling Cetri, if the period number is closest to one, then add backslash I here, which is a rich text formatting command that means make this italics. If the period number is closest to two, then put backslash B here, which means this is the rich text format code for make it bold, and then write test in this format. So what we would see as a result is that in period one, test would be printed in italics, and in period two and thereafter, test would be, print, would be printed in bold. This is a list of uh, many of the rich text formatting codes that are supported in Cetri, which is taken directly from the manual. Uh, so you can use this as a resource to look up which formatting codes you can actually lose, be, use, because not all rich text formatting codes are supported in Cetri. On this slide, you can see even more layout types than we've discussed so far. So we discussed the layout uh, where we just put a number and we said that the variable, the input variable would then have to be a multiple of this number or the output variable will be rounded to become an out, uh, a multiple of this number. We also had the text option down here, but we didn't have the others. You can use uh, radio buttons or create radio buttons by using um, exclamation mark radio. And then the the options that are shown on screen are there in quotes. And what is saved in the variable is here the number before the quote. So if you select 86.6.8 uh, here, what is actually saved in the variable would be a one in the input case. And in the output case, uh, if the variable uh, is closest to, eight, to one, it would be displayed as 86.8. If it's closest to 24, it will be displayed at 102.8. You can also create a radio line where you just specify the extreme values, so the lower and the higher bound basically, and uh, the number of steps in between, and Cetri will then save basically it will, so the first step is this one, the last step is this one, and everything else in between will be interpolated between 
the two extremes. You will see a, a line that looks like this with, in this case, six steps, uh, and the labels zero and five as they were specified here in, in quotes. Very similar for the slider. So you can have a slider here that looks very similar. A scroll bar, again, the specification is pretty similar to the radial line. Then you can have a checkbox. And for the checkbox, you only need to specify one option. Uh, the, uh, otherwise, if it's unchecked, it will be set to zero. Okay. And finally, we have the formatting as a button, where is an input item, it looks like this, and an output item, it just looks like normal text, just like um, the text up here. The important thing to note here is these are not real buttons in the sense of normal buttons in set tree, but if you click accept, then the variable uh, value will be changed to one, and if you click reject, it will be changed to zero but you will not, by clicking one of these buttons, continue to the next screen. For that, you need a proper button and not one that is created by just having a layout in an item that says button. Apart from numbers, you can have subjects also entering text, uh, and you would do that by specifying a layout that is string. And uh, the minimum and maximum here in this case mean the minimum and no maximum number of characters the subjects can enter. So this way you can have them enter, for example, a certain text and that will be saved uh, in a string variable. Some general notes on formatting. The first is if you want your variables to refresh while they're being displayed on screen. What this means is that while subjects are looking on their screen, if one of the variables that are currently being displayed in one of the items changes, should this change be visible on screen? So should the number that is shown on screen change in real time, then you need to put the text in the layout. So using this text layout function, as opposed to the label, whatever is in the label is fixed from the moment the screen is being displayed and does not refresh, so you need to put the text in a layout if you want it to refresh. Furthermore, and I mentioned this just a few slides ago, the screen space is reserved for the initial value of a variable. So make, your sure, make sure you account for that. And finally, if you want to change the font size generally, not only in an individual item by using rich text formatting, then you can do this for your entire set leaf basically by opening the set leaf using the command line switch slash font size and then specifying the font size and that will make the default font size in set leaf equal to this font size but of course you can always override this within uh, the treatment by using rich text formatting in the treatment button placement you have uh, the option of choosing the button placement and i talked about this before uh, in each box, or in most boxes, you have the option of choosing the button position, which by default is to the lower right, to the bottom, uh, bottom right, and in rows. And that's what it looks like. The first button would be positioned here, the second here, the third here, the fourth here, the fifth here, in a box that is so small. Then if you put it um, top right and in columns, you'll see it's first, second, third, fourth, fifth or you can also put it in the middle in columns and it would just go like this. Haven't used it ever, so but you can use it if you want to. And you can also um, use an underscore as a button name and that creates an empty space where the button should be, just like using the underscore as a variable name in an item generates an empty space um, where the, button, uh, the, the variable value should be uh, in the item output. The final topic I want to discuss in this chapter is how to check entries for correctness. The entries that your subjects make in uh, the fields, the input fields that you provide for them. Now, the first way you can ensure proper um, entries is to set the minimum and maximum value in your item and the layout in the item such that your subject can only enter numbers between the minimum and maximum you specify and um, can only enter numbers that are multiples of the value you, the num numeric value that you put in the layout field. 
But if you need something more um, complex than that, you can use a so-called checker. And the way to do this is to select the button that closes the screen, that moves on, that submits the entries, and then you click Treatment New Checker. And that opens this field here where you can specify the checker. And for the checker, you specify a condition that needs to be fulfilled for the subject to be allowed to continue to the next uh, stage. That's the usual use case. So you specify a condition here, the number of shares that the subject has. So in this example, um, the subject is trying to sell a share of stock in the experiment. Now for that, the subject needs to have at least one share. If, so the number of shares needs to be greater than zero. If this is not the case, what will happen is that the computer will display this message. So this, remember, this message is only displayed if the condition is not fulfilled. And then there are multiple options what can happen and what the box can show. You can specify whether there should be a yes button, a no button, or both buttons. Now, in this case, there is only a no button, which has the label OK. So what subjects will see is a button that says that's the label OK. And if they click it, they will not go on to the next stage, but will stay on the current screen and have to modify uh, their entry. If instead we put this OK here in the yes field, this would be basically an informative message saying, now what you did um, means this and this, for example. But if you click it, you would go on to the next stage because it's a yes button. And you could also specify two labels here, for example, um, OK and Cancel. And this way, the subject could decide whether they want to um, click OK and go on or cancel their choice and stay on the same screen. Or you could label them yes or no and say, do you really want to do this? And then they click yes, they go on to the next screen. If they click no, they do not go on to the next screen. And of course, the conditions, the condition using uh, and and or operators can contain, well, can be much more complex than this. It can, can basically link several conditions to, to one big condition, which all need to be fulfilled. That's one option of what you could do. But you can also add multiple checkers to one button to check for multiple problems with the entry that the subject made.